Hey guys, this is Mike DeHaan with the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast. I just want to take a brief moment to talk about one of our partners, Ballpoint Marketing. Direct mail has been a staple marketing method for off-market real estate investors, really since you know everyone started looking for their own deals. If you've sent direct mail before, I'm guessing it was in the form of a yellow letter, something that was pretty generic and cheap, and maybe even got a few deals from that. But at the end of the day, you're not really going to stand out compared to anybody else. That's where Ballpoint Marketing comes in. Ballpoint marketing actually sends letters that are written by a ballpoint pen that is controlled by a robot. They have literally have a warehouse that has thousands and thousands of these robots that are just writing letters with ballpoint pens, and they create the similar effect as if you were actually sitting at your kitchen table writing it yourself. Since we started using them several years ago, we found our conversions really started to increase. When it comes to marketing, it's all about standing out compared to your competitors. So something as simple as these handwritten letters can really go a long way. Now, if you use our code MD5, as in Mike Dehan5, at ballpointmarketing.com, you will get 5% off your next order. 5% might not sound like a lot, but when you're ordering the kind of marketing you need to be doing to get deals, you know, several thousand dollars worth, it's going to really start to add up. For example, if you were spending $5,000 on marketing next month, you'd be saving 250 bucks. Yet over the course of an entire year, it's gonna be thousands of dollars in savings right in your pocket. So anyway, I can't say enough good things about Ballpoint. Give them a try at ballpointmarketing.com and use our code MD5. Thanks. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast with your host, Mike DeHaan and Dan Austin. From wins, losses, horror stories, and tactics for optimizing your business, Mike and Dan take a real, uncensored deep dive into the ins and outs of running a full-time real estate investment and wholesaling business. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 10 of the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is uh, take two. We had a, a, a re... I guess say an error with uh, the first recording of this. So we're going to redo a couple of days later, but uh, it's okay. Cause I felt like we were a little bit rushed the first time. So I think we'll be, uh, you know, it'll come out a little bit yeah. better. Um, so uh, yeah, we're collecting these real estate podcast. My name is Mike DeHaan. I'm here with my business partner, Dan Austin. We run a uh, real estate investing wholesaling business up in the Pacific Northwest. And we are diving into the actual roots of running this business. We do everything from, Rental properties, Airbnbs, wholesales, flips, you name it. We've kind of touched all of it. And uh, we're yeah. almost good at some of it too. <laughs> almost good at some of it, depending on the day. Yeah. You know, definitely the, uh, you know, not specializing in anything, but sort of jack of all trades, which honestly, though, I, I would say that one thing we are good at, though, is creating opportunities from stuff that people write off. Sure. Because oh, yeah. We've, yeah. we've had so many killer deals that have turned out to be awesome, but they're just not you know, like bread and butter, you know, right. doing wacky shit, like cutting in staircases and, um, you know, like, well, so we don't like finishing basements, you Adding know, removing bathrooms. walls, like expanding living areas, you know, eliminating bedrooms. Some people would say is like blasphemous, but you know, we've done that to basically make a layout that much more appealing as like a rental, um, you know, garage conversions. <laughs> like, yeah. We've kind done of, a lot yeah. of weird stuff, but it, I mean, it's not weird when you look at the, the dollars and cents of everything. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, at the core of it, you know, especially if you're buying stuff at a discount and you're trying to, you know, burr a property, you know, buy rehab, rent, refinance, repeat in order for that to work, you need to increase the value of the property as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the biggest issues. I think a lot of people struggle is, you know, they look at like traditional, sort of like the traditional viewpoint of like what a flip is where you buy a shitty property, you make the kitchen look good, you make the bathrooms mm -hmm. modern, whatever. And it's like, that's only good. That's going to increase your value for sure. But you know, a lot of the houses that we buy aren't that bad. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. You, you know, yeah, see, know you can buy it and you put in some granite countertops, but it's not going to increase the value as much as increasing the square footage. No. Yeah. And you it's know, learning where to spend your money. I mean, that's always what people talk about. Like, where do you spend the money? And they say kitchen sell. But when you're doing it from an investment standpoint, um, yeah. that's not necessarily the value add you always need to do. Right. Yeah. Um, we do a lot of, you know, Monday, I think we're going to start breaking up the concrete and another property of ours to add a bathroom. And that's mm -hmm. solely from a comp standpoint, right? Add, yeah. add the square footage, finish the basement in our market. We have quite a few houses that were built in the fifties. Um, and 
they didn't have finished basements, but they were ready to go. Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. it's all there. Well, and with our model too, with our folks being on these rental properties and being able to increase the value for ourselves, you know, that what that process looks like when you're exiting, um, I guess you're, you're trying to pull your cash out. The appraiser goes and looks at the actual value, right? And, and mm -hmm. that's going to come down to cost per square footage of the nearby properties. They will then um, take that cost per square footage, multiply it by your square footage and give you the value of your yep. property. Versus like when you're selling it on the market, you know, realistically what an appraiser is going to do <laughs> is they're going to say like, oh, what's your purchase price? Yeah, sure. It's going to be right on the money. If you guys want the transaction <laughs> right. to get done, they don't care. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, at that rate, I think the the kitchen and stuff um, carries a little bit more value than if you're just going straight to an appraiser on a refinance. Because if it's a rental property, honestly, like they'll look at the like for like with some of those details. But at the end of the day, they don't really care, you know, especially in this market where it's so hot and mm -hmm. stuff that isn't as um, fixed up, isn't as modernized as selling for just as high as the modern properties. I mean, well, then that, this is a good conversation because this is like, um, a lot of folks that, that teach the, the Burr model, you know, everybody's talking about it these days. They don't talk about the actual appraisal piece. Like in the perfect world, you, you buy a house, you renovate it, and then it appraises for the value you want it because that's mm -hmm. after restored value. But that's not always the case because, um, a lot of the appraisers are used to saying, oh, this sold on the MLS for 300. Gosh, my appraisal is right at 300, right? You know? Yeah. Um, I've had appraisers knock off, you know, 5,000 bucks because I covered up a fireplace because it was crappy. I didn't want to really do anything with it. So we drywalled over it and it's like, well, that's 5,000 off. It's like, whoa, wait, okay. So then you start looking at what does matter. You know, garages do, um, add that's a checkbox on their little, you know, mm -hmm. machine that they, you know, put all this stuff into, but then you have to look at what is the price per square foot going for right now versus losing some percentage for not having a garage. And exactly. if the price per square foot's higher, then you're going to go that way. Other things that matter is like for us, especially you got to realize when you're buying off market, the, the appraiser has to work harder because they don't know necessarily. They're used to saying, um, oh, it sold for this six months ago. Why the heck is it worth $200,000 more now? Why do you think so? But if you can talk to your appraiser and say, yeah, we bought it off market direct from the seller, they're going to say, oh, okay, that makes sense. So I can't really use that as a comp basically that it was only worth 200 last six, you know, six months ago. Um, and then other things of like the renovations you do and talking to the appraiser, you got to kind of, you don't have to, they're not supposed to take your input, but you can share with them that information. And another good thing is talking about the comps. Like we've had some really good tailwinds because we've had comps before. They're just outrageous, like not even in the same neighborhood, but then you tell the appraiser, like these are our comps. And then they look at it and they're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. It makes my job easier. Some of them are jerks and they're like, I don't care what you say. I'm an appraiser, but if you if you can have a good relationship with them and, and communicate with them, you can usually get more favorable terms. Totally, one hundred percent. And I mean, and also too, it's like just like everything else, it's a relationship, right, with these people. So when we've done appraisals, um, like some of my, my own stuff as well, I always try to make sure that I'm there and I meet them and I kind of connect with the appraiser. And you know, I'll tell them explicitly what I want to be getting for my number. Or especially right. doing refinances. And I'll always, I mean, it's just like a sales process, right? I'll always say higher than I actually want it to be. So that way when, it right. comes, when, when, when they're like, well, I can't quite give you that, but they like, you know, they, they want to appease me. Yeah. Because we had a good connection and they yeah. give me that number that's a little bit lower. It's like, perfect. That's actually what I was okay with. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, it is, you're right. It's like you got anchor them high. Exactly. Yeah. But you know, you do enough deals in town, like you start seeing the same appraisers around. Um, yeah. all, you know, we're kind of in an appraisal crisis right now because there's just not enough appraisers around, but, um, yeah, you start kind of building relationships and knowing, knowing who they are and they kind of get mm -hmm. used to it. They go, okay, I get it. Yep. These guys do know what they're doing. So if they say something, it's, it's more of a fact than just a BS thing. Yeah, for sure. You know, and, and it's, yeah, it's, there's, there's an art to it. And then, you know, like you said, figuring out what the true value adds are, right. you know, like you mentioned, giving up the garage for another bedroom or something like that. Like the one that we did that on, it was a one bed, one bath property with a tiny garage that wasn't really useful for a modern car. So we took that little garage and converted it into a two bed, one bath property, which was significantly more valuable than a one bed, one bath property. Um, even though we lost the garage, like, you know, the garage is worth like 7,500 bucks. I think we calculated, but the extra bedroom is worth like 35,000. Exactly. So net, that's obviously huge. a major positive. Yeah. yeah huge. Do it. Um, yeah, exactly. And then now we have another property we're looking to do exactly the same thing. It's currently a 2-1 um, that we're going to be turning into. Maybe well, I guess maybe we haven't totally finalized this into a 
two. Three, two. Yeah. It's like a little closet that could pretty easily be turned into a bathroom, it seems like. Yep. Yep. And so, from functionality, if the garage is junk, like don't worry yeah. about it. You know what I mean? And we live in a climate where there's snow and obviously a garage is preferable, but on the, the house you're talking about, which is our next Airbnb is um, the garage. You can't park anything in it except for a yeah. small ladybug. Is that what they're called? Yeah. Or a slug bug? Whatever the heck they call it. Uh, Volkswagen. Yeah. A Volkswagen yeah. bug. Yeah. Yeah. You know. a bright, like mint green slug bug. That she <laughs> Probably the only car that would fit in there besides maybe yeah. like a Fiat. A motorcycle. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know, just, uh, yeah. yeah, it's, I mean, that that's where the money's made. And it's funny because yep. so many people don't necessarily want to do those items because they're, you know, a little bit trickier and a little bit more costly yep. than just, you know, ripping out a kitchen and updating it. Right. But I mean, that's where we make almost all of our money, yeah. you know, and then and, you know, know, that just to refinance out pretty much everything. So a lot of our properties, we have just a tiny bit of cash in them, you know, if any at all. Right. Yeah, exactly. And if you can do those numbers and have those kind of like, we know what it's going to cost to add a bathroom in a basement on. It's not like we're just doing this willy nilly. Uh, we've done it before several times. And so we kind of know our costs and we know what buildings we can do it to. You don't want to try to do that on a building that it's just not a good idea to do it on, you know, low ceilings and rock foundations or something weird like that. But if it was built in 1950s and after, it's a slam dunk. Just the way they set up the plumbing yeah. and all that sort of stuff. The construction standards are, are standardized and you just kind of know. And so just the process, it's go get a sewer guy to scope it and paint on the ground where the sewer line goes. And that tells you where you put your bathroom. Yeah. Honestly. Exactly. And then you you break it up concrete. That's just manual labor and concrete's cheap to fill back in the hole. And then just the plumbing expense is probably the most expensive because everything else is two by fours and drywall. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, it's all repeatable. It's all the same yeah. thing after a while. Yep. But, yeah. Speaking of processes, yeah. I know you had a really great experience with our uh, our first Airbnb. <laughs> yeah. Our oh, first man. Airbnb went live last Friday. Figuring out that process a little bit, you yeah. know, which involves we learned pre-screening the uh, potential renters, not just initially accepting everybody. Yeah. Even that, I don't know if that works because they had good reviews, but yeah, yeah so I'll, I'll start with, yeah, it was our first ever Airbnb went live and we were pretty stoked because we went live and like pretty much was like a week ago and pretty much every day was booked for the month minus like some mid midweek stuff. Um, yeah. But our first um, guest was all week, Monday through Friday. Um, and she said in her um, message, you know, when she booked it uh, that, you know, we're a military family, we're just looking to stay here for a bit before we head out of town. I was like, okay, like husband, wife, kids, that's fine. And then everything was going fine. They checked in, no, no questions. And then checkout was Friday at 10 a.m. And our cleaners showed up and basically said, there's a dog in the house and people still here. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. So I like messaged the, the, ten, the guest and nothing, no answer. And so I'm like, okay, crap, I'm gonna have to show up. Um, anyhow, so I show up and there's a dog, like a big dog and the house is trash. Like I'm just looking through the windows cause I didn't want to bust in on him. But I'm like knocking on the door, no answer, no answer. I call the lady and tell her, I'm like, Hey, it's, you know, 1215, um, uh, checkout is at 10 AM. And she's like, Oh really? Like totally nonchalant. Like, wasn't like, I don't care. She was just totally like, I don't care. Like whatever. I was like, well, you need to leave. And she's like, oh, okay, let me call my husband, I guess. So I'm just sitting there waiting and this guy shows up. He's in a military uniform. We have an air force base here in town. And as a previous army guy, I think, you know, very <laughs> lowly of the air force folks anyways. So, and I can say that, um, and he has this young kid in an air force uniform shows up, runs inside and he's just in there and I'm just waiting. So I'm like, I'm not going to leave till these people leave. Cause I just want to make sure. Cause I want to tell the cleaners to get here right away. Cause we had another guest coming in at 4 PM. So ideally six hours, clean it, do the laundry, all that, blah, blah, blah. You know, so the clock's ticking and then like some other dude shows up in uh, another, you know, Air Force guy shows a military uniform, he had a sweet mustache, all that sort of stuff. And he comes running in and they're just in there. I don't know what they're doing. And all of a sudden they start coming out of the house, like with boxes and <laughs> trash bags full of stuff. I'm like, for a second, I'm like, are they like robbing us? Like what's going on? And then they just like plants, they were pulling out plants, like everything, but a fish tank they came out with, like they had moved in to the Airbnb. Yeah, I don't know what their plan was, but they moved in. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. 
they were filming a porno in there, dude. <laughs> they were you know, doing something. They needed their props, like their setup. Yeah, props. right. <laughs> it was so weird. And like, it took them so long. I'm not, it wasn't like, oh, we're in and out in 20 minutes. Like it took them like forever to get it out. And then all of a sudden they come out. Yeah, it's like a huge dog, which of course, like they didn't say they were bringing a dog. And, you know, on Airbnb, it's nice to have a dog and you're supposed to bring a kennel, all that sort of stuff if you're going to do it. Yeah. Um, but it was just like mind blowing. And then... So I text the cleaners. I'm like, I got to go to another appointment. They, I, they just pulled, they took off a text the cleaners. They're awesome. They showed up like five minutes later. So I, I, I take off, get home. And, um, the cleaners are like, yeah, so these people left a bunch of stuff here, including like jewelry, like diamond rings and earrings and like weird stuff that I'm like, you don't usually just leave that. And the worst part about it is they've never asked for their stuff back. So I just told them to lock it in the basement cleaning closet and I should go up there and like, I don't know, maybe we should make a little extra profit on this stuff. But like, I would have thought they would have messaged me like, hey, by the way, we left a bunch of stuff there. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think we need to reach out to them and see if they want it. But if not, what's the appropriate amount of time to wait? Before you start <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Like, <laughs> just like, who does that? Like that for our first guest, right? Yeah. Like that is I, my expectations at Airbnb were a little different. Than that. Yeah. <laughs> So well, well, the second one we've had since didn't seem good though. Yeah. The second guy. And I messaged the second guy like, Hey, just, you know, this happened. He's like, Oh, no worry. He's like, we're not even going to get in until late. So I was like, sweet. So yeah. they had, we had plenty of time to get it set and ready to go. Um, although the cleaners did leave the towels in the dryer, I think they, um, or something like that. They didn't take them out. Cause I told them, I was like, don't just don't wash it. Just throw it all in the cleaners closet and we'll come around the next time and mm -hmm. do all the laundry. And so the dude actually like folded it all like the next guest. He's like, yeah, so I folded all the laundry that was in there. I was like, man, what a nice guy. Like what a nice guy. Like total, like polar opposite guest. And I was like, yeah, right. thanks, buddy. Which, which I think that'll be most people. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I, I've gone to stay in Airbnbs and been pretty rowdy, but tell you what, you'd never know by the time we left. It's always spotless. Right. That's, and you that's know? nice to do, right? You don't yeah. want to trash someone's house. Yeah, exactly. That's so weird with the first one. Like, you know, their military, were they, were they like traveling somewhere, like passing through? But at the same time, why would they have stayed there for five days? Why would they have moved their entire life savings of belongings in? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Maybe they were moving, right? They didn't want to like leave it in the car. And, you know, maybe you have a car theft, you know, car breaking issue in Spokane. Yeah. So, you know, you leave like all your bags and stuff in there. People walk around that neighborhood and like, it's not unheard of to think someone's smashing your window and stealing your stuff. They were totally like, I do not want somebody stealing my potted plants. <laughs> Better bring those inside. That's the well, one. Those would, those would die. Those make more sense than like the boxes. <laughs> That's come on. <laughs> oh, man. It's fascinating. But. Yeah, it was, it was interesting, but we got over it. We're, we're good. Yeah. We're on the men now. So yeah. Yeah. No, it'll, it'll be, it'll, it'll be cool to see how it goes. I mean, our, our first response to it, I was, I was pretty excited about, um, cause I mean, we got, yes, we got booked up and we already have bookings out There's a couple in January, a couple in February, um, mm -hmm. you know, yep. March booked. If yeah. March even, you know? yeah. And that's where like pricing comes in too. Like we got to pay attention because there's a lot of local events. Um, mm -hmm. like one, one of them that dinged uh, was like, Oh, we're coming in town for the high school basketball tournament. So every year they have a state tournament in Spokane. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, so that's a hot weekend. But then I was like, Oh shoot, we usually have, um, college women and or men's ncaa you know regional tournaments here so they're having the women's tournament here in march so it's like okay we need to get in there and dial up that pricing so that we yeah. can hit all of those every weekend and that's kind of my assumption with airbnb is if you wanted to maximize your profits you do need to dial in all your weekends and all your events and your yeah. pricing and not just rely on like a national pricing company that's going to hit the holidays and oh it's summer is typically hot so we increase prices it's like well which days in the summer are the hottest so that we can maximize those profits knowing that there's going to be slow days like the Tuesday through Thursday or whatever, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Especially during the winter time here. Yeah. That's a valid point. So, you know, and even, yeah, I think those sort of events people come here. I mean, we got hoop fest, you know, mm -hmm. which is what, like the largest three on three street yeah. basketball tournament in the country. People come from yeah. all over the United States for that. You know, we got blooms day, which is a big, it's a 10 K run that people come mm -hmm. from all over the Northwest for, um, you got a lot of random stuff. I mean, honestly, even if there's like big Gonzaga basketball games, mm -hmm. Yep, that that would definitely be something to to look into. Or yep. I wonder if things Mom. like concerts, like you know, if like let's say that like Metallica was playing here, do you think that that would be? I mean, that's going to draw people from somewhere. No, but if Elton John was playing here, <laughs> now that's a different ball game. That's true. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're right, and there's just like those little nuances too, like. Oh, it's mom's weekend at 
you yeah. know, whatever I, college, stuff like that, where you just, if you, I think if you dial that in, you can really maximize your profit. Cause otherwise what I'm realizing is if you just put on set and forget it, you, you're not gonna get the best pricing. You're probably going to be missing like 30% of your profits, honestly. Yeah, which is, yeah, exactly. It'd be significant. You know, I mean, even, even if you can charge an extra a hundred, hundred fifty dollars a night for a weekend, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, that's an extra 500 bucks. Yeah. Exactly. You know, that's, that's very significant. Um, yeah, no, it'll, it'll be a cool thing to figure out. And then it'll be interesting too, to know how, so, so this one property we have is, you know, in the, it's in a nicer neighborhood right by this area called Manitou Park, which is, you know, like a, how would you describe Manitou Park? It's like a very sort of ritzy. It's like, sort of it's like, like central old money place to live. Yeah. It's like central park in New York city, but for a town of like a quarter million. Exactly. So, right. So not at all like central park, but nice. Yeah, right. Still yeah, is. but it's nice, you know, and it's close to everything. And there, it's like a place that professionals and stuff would want to stay or, you know, yeah, like it's close to hospitals, close, close to the downtown core. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we, we have that one. And then our other one that should be launching what in the next week or so is like walking distance to downtown, walking distance to like the trendy rush, one of the trendy restaurant areas in town, yeah. which will 100% be like, let's be honest, like a bachelor party sort of house. Yeah, like about, yeah. Like party sort of house, yeah. you know, or like people that are wanting to go party. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like a definitely not as nice of a house as the one by the park. But mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to know, like, see how the, the rent out rates, you know, the rental rates and things like that vary and like the occupancy rates. Because, I mean, I bet there will be a difference. Oh, for um, sure. You know, it, it'll it'll I think it'll just be like a little bit of experimenting to start figuring that out. We got to start figuring out the KPIs and that sort of stuff. But, yep. hmm. Yeah. Now it's, it's interesting. I, and one of the things I've, I've realized too, with, with Airbnb, which I guess I've heard this before as well, is that, you know, it's, there's, there's the rentals and the flip stuff is very much like real estate investing. You can kind of set it and forget it. But with the Airbnbs, it's definitely like a hospitality business, you know, and there's like the yeah. little things that will probably go significantly farther than you even realize. Right. Um, you know, like I was thinking, I have this old patio furniture that's still at one of my rentals. Um, we got to go and get that stuff and set it over there. Cause I mean like that, we built a brand new deck on this thing. If we have like a nice sitting area out there with right. like a, a barbecue or something, you know, over the summer, like that will do dividends for people, you know, totally. Um, or like, uh, you know, even just like, I don't know, adding some recreational stuff somewhere at the house, like, you know, some cornhole in the back or some sort of, Oh, I thought you were going to say marijuana. <laughs> some no, recreational like, stuff yeah, yeah. Right. games yeah. you're right yeah yeah just games or whatever you know so people have something to do especially because we do have that sort of open area in the back for right now yeah um, you know i think that there's there's a lot of opportunities there but yeah it'll be it'll be good i'm excited about it um yeah. and then what else do we have going on last week uh mm. well we started good. the renovation on our flip um well yeah yeah, sort of well, started. We got it closed. We got it cleaned out. Yeah. We did. so we much did. crap in there. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Yeah, we talked about that one a little bit last week. We got it, finally got it cleaned out. Um, and crazily enough, it smells worst. I've it's never had that happen. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was. it's one of those deals where, like, you don't know what you're getting into. Because, like, as I walked yeah. it again um, after it got all cleaned out, it's like, oh, every window is broken. But you yeah. could, it wasn't really quite apparent, right, that they were broken even from the outside. But then you get inside and now there's not stuff stacked from the, to the ceiling. You're like, OK, we got to do windows now. So little budgetary stuff you got to account for in kind of your your um, reserves on a, on a property when you're doing stuff because it adds cost. Yeah, exactly. You know, little stuff that you just know is going to happen. For sure. Yeah. So you got that one. And then well, I guess our one of our next sort of big things um, why, oh, that's, that's coming up is uh, so – people always sort of reach out and they ask how, what's the best way to get started in real estate. Um, and, you know, everyone always says, go network with people, go find people mm -hmm. that do what you want to do and connect with them. And uh, our acquisitions manager, James basically made that leap six months ago. Now, when he started working with us, you know, he was left his other job to come work for us. He was making less money at the start because it's so commission based. And, uh, you know, his goal was basically just getting the flipping houses. And we have, I guess, the um, honor of connecting him with his first flip house that is, yep. I think, funding today or tomorrow. Um, yep. But uh, so he's buying the house from the business. 
and he didn't quite have enough money to make the down payment plus the renovation. So I'm personally partnering with him to get the deal uh, closed for him, connecting him with a lender. And he's going to be doing the rehab himself, putting in the sweat equity. And he should be making, you know, pretty good money off this deal. I think anywhere yeah. from like 30 to 50,000, depending on how it sells. Yep. And, you know, that all came from bringing us tremendous value. We were more than happy to connect him with a sweet deal. Right. So I yeah. think it's one of the big, biggest things, you know, if you want to, if you really want to get started investing in real estate or flipping properties or whatever, bring people that are actually doing that value and they will return the favor. And a lot of people don't necessarily seem to realize what exactly that takes, but right. You know, he's been busting his ass for us for six months. So for us to give him a lie down deal like that is is pretty easy decision for us to make. Yeah. I mean, and that's like textbook. Like if you were to simplify exactly what you said is he knew he made a decision. He had no experience in real estate to start. Mm -hmm. He made a decision. He wanted to be in real estate. He sought out folks and found us. We hired him. Yep. And he's you know, worked his butt off. And now not only did we hire him, we're giving him his first real estate deal. He's going to mm -hmm. flip it. He networked with people, he got you um, to help him lend it down. And so, you know, that's value to you as well. You, you need to park money, right? Yeah. Um, and you're helping him connect him to a lender so that you can help get him better rates than, you know, typically a new investor would. So you're sweetening the pot just as much. He's, he's brought tremendous value to our business, right? Um, yeah. But you've also been able to sweeten the pot because of that. So that's paying him dividends. And I was doing like that. I was thinking about that, like a guy, a guy doing that, like starting from zero to where he's at now is just amazing. But you know, he's gonna be, he could be easily if he keeps doing what he's doing. He's knocking on the door of quite a bit of money every year for annual salary, going from working for a company mm -hmm. totally outside of our our realm to well into six figures. Oh yeah, easily. You know, easily. Um, I mean, if you look at his total commission, I mean, it was start with July, but if he'd doing that the entire year, he'd make six six figures this year. And that's yeah. not even including his, you know, if he does his flip and he said he wants to do a couple more next year, he was able to do two, three flips next year, plus be getting commissions on the same deal, uh, same sort of, uh, what's the right word I'm thinking of, you know, same sort of clip that he's been getting this year. Yep. You know, he'll be making multi six figures next year, probably. He's going to make more money than us. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah, he's, you know what I mean though? But it's like simple, like. It's not, I guess my point in bringing that up is trying to simplify it. It's not that complex because then you add in, so you go do this and you're you, at first the leap is tough for people, right? Because mm -hmm. they're like, oh, I got to go and like sacrifice. They feel like it's a sacrifice, but really it's this mutual beneficial thing. And then you add that fact that he can easily get two or three flips a year because he is part of the lead flow. He's the one generating that, right? You know, as far as bringing them in. And so if he does that, adds two or three flips on top of his job, which is very doable. Like mm -hmm. that is a lot of, that's a lot of income, life changing for a lot of people. For sure. Yeah. And you know, like I said, people, people feel like it's a trade off, but if you look at it net, even if it's an immediate sort of reduction in your pay or security, mm -hmm. if you're successful over a year, it's a net positive, but like, you know, 10 X result probably for a lot of people. Right. Yeah. But I mean, that's, cool. that's kind of what it takes. And, and I think a lot of people as well, the, the short-term discomfort for long-term rewards, they don't realize how quickly that can actually change. I mean, you know, I only started investing in 2018, you know, and right. things have changed yeah. a lot. And you were just a couple of years before that, mm -hmm. you know, things go exponential um, and they exponentially grow once you sort of get inertia. I mean, I was kind of looking at our numbers and I was like, so first year I bought, um, I guess it was three properties. And then after that, I bought, was it five? The year after that, with yours, um, you know, like I guess the second year was five, but mostly of those were flips and one rental. The year after that, I bought five rentals and then Yumi bought four rentals, I think. So that's nine total. And this year, our total doors, we bought like, it's gonna, we're, we're going to, I think my portfolio plus our drum is going to be at 40. So I think us jointly, we're at like what, 26, 27. Something probably, yeah, somewhere in yeah. there. I don't yeah. know. It changes every week, it seems like, depending I mean, on you know, what we're doing. We change right. our minds on things, yeah. And then we just, you know, we buy things that we tend to flip and then we keep, and then we buy things we intend yeah. to keep and then we flip, yeah. But, and it does just happen. You got to show up, you got to be yeah. consistent. It takes it does take patience, but it it does. It kind of just all of a sudden you look back, you're like, holy cow, I how did I do four flips and then add these doors? And it was just by showing up every day, yeah, exactly. But yeah. Anyway, I think, you know, so what people say, it's taking massive action consistently, 
That's sort of what it comes down to and being willing to be uncomfortable with that long-term reward. Cause tell you what, you know, when, when you're when you sort of get the power to, you know, make 50 to $60,000 off of like a single deal, all of a sudden your $80,000 salary seems like. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, totally. So anyway, I think that's a good place to stop there. Any good lessons learned this week, Dan? Um, yeah, I, I would go back to the Airbnb story. It's, it's like talking about systems. You know, we are long-term rental guys. We're kind of dabbling in the Airbnb space. Um, but even with our long-term rentals, like for me, it's like always a rush to get that door open for tenants or guests mm-hmm. for Airbnbs to move in. Um, and really in the back of my mind, it's like, oh, we got carry costs. We, let's get this thing out. We're missing out on revenue. But at the end of the day, it's really not in the percentage of the project it's really not that much money to carry it a week or two longer mm-hmm. and like just figure your system out. Cause when we lo- went live with Airbnb, like I still hadn't figured out the cleaners. Like I kind of had a, I had like a plan a, but no plan B and I like to have a plan B and we ended up having to find a plan B and went with plan B on yeah. the cleaner situation. Um, while guests were there, like we were yeah. still figuring that out. So, and then, then I got, you know, we got caught with our pants down with this guest not moving out on time. Right. And so just take your time and there, there's the, there's like a, a line between analysis paralysis and not paying attention to anything and just going, you know, head first into things and dialing that in and taking the time to make sure you go down your checklist that you have things going. Like it's definitely totally okay to go in with your feet first if you're willing to work and hustle. But like, I'm at a point to where I'm like, I don't want to have to work that hard. Let me just take the extra time to like dial this thing in, get the systems in. Cause there's been plenty of times where we've got tenants moving in and we're like, Oh, this light switch isn't working all of a sudden. Yeah. Despite the fact that we do checks, like after a renovation is done, we check everything, but sometimes there's just these little weird things that happen. And so taking the time to get your systems in, cause it's a lot less stressful. I can assure you yeah. that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, I guess the counterpoint that I would say is there's no quicker way to learn by putting yourself under extreme pressure. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, like, like you'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. That's I mean, how, how I've done a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, how many times has there been stuff you're like, Oh, I need to do that. And then all of a sudden it's like, this needs to be figured out in 20 minutes. And, and <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. Procrastinating on for right. two weeks. It's your best work. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Exactly. yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I like it. All right. Um, my name is Mike Dehan. You can find me on Instagram at Mike underscore invest. Um, my business partner here is Dan Austin. You can find him on Instagram at investor man, Dan, Go ahead and give us a follow on Instagram and uh, like and subscribe to our podcast here. We would appreciate it. And give us some uh, five-star reviews. If you have things that aren't five-star to say, shoot me a DM instead. I would, I would appreciate that. <laughs> right. um, and then our, our website is going to be going live here, uh, clickingkeyspodcast.com. If you go on there and give us your email, you will get our five-step guide to start generating off-market leads, which pretty much outlines the exact way that we got started with our business like literally the first five steps that we sort of took. Um, mm-hmm. So a little ebook. It's like, I think like five, six pages. It's pretty quick, but it's simple, a but it's, it. it's a lot of value in there. Honestly, yeah, cause that's exactly. what it really comes down to. It is simple. You just got to focus and be consistent, show up every day. Yep. Just got to jump into it. So cool. We're right on everybody. Have a good week and we'll talk to you next Wednesday. See y'all next week. Thanks for listening. Please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And check us out at CollectingKeysPodcast.com for tips and guides on starting your own real estate investment and wholesaling business.